Now we want to welcome all again to the second session of the ministry this afternoon. And before we turn to the word of God, I want to look to the Lord again in prayer. Let us pray together. Our Father, we bow once more before thee and thank thee for the ministry of thy word that we've been listening to this afternoon. We thank thee that in the midst of a changing world and so much failure, we thank thee we have thy word and we thank thee that we have thee to turn to. And we look to thee for the session before us now that thy continued help would be experienced and that we, again we might be warmed in our hearts to the Saviour. Father, bless thy word now to our hearts, we pray, as we look to thee for help in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like you to turn with me for this session, please, to the Old Testament, to the book of the Psalms. Perhaps it doesn't just exactly follow on from what we've been listening to in the last session, but it is my exercise. I want to read in Psalm number 24. Psalm number 24. And verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend in, into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up your ever everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Now that will be our reading, and with the Lord's blessing. <clears throat> now all of us, I'm sure, have appreciated very much these the three Psalms that go together, the trilogy of Psalm 22 and Psalm 23 and Psalm 24. It's not my exercise at all to go through them. It would be interesting to do so, but my time is limited this afternoon. Just to say, as we all have appreciated often, Psalm 22, it's the sufferer. Psalm 23, it's the shepherd. And Psalm 24, it is the sovereign. I like to think that in Psalm 22, he, the saviour is the victim. In Psalm number 23, the saviour is in the valley. He's with his own. And then Psalm 24, he is the victor. Now what I want to do in this half hour that I have before me is to lift our eyes again from the circumstances that's around. We live in a world where there's disorientation, where there's disappointment, where there's discouragement, where there's death. And the believer could very easily become disorientated. Brethren and sisters, I think there's nothing will orientate us there's nothing will help us to get focused, to get again a glimpse of how it all will end. God's purposes are still going to be fulfilled. Thank God for that. We have been appreciating very much yesterday the rapture, the coming of the Lord Jesus for his own. And I want us to take a step further this afternoon. And I want to think of that glorious day that's lying before. When the Son of God, God's beloved Son, the King of Kings, the Lord of hosts, is going to be accepted and uh, put into position in the city. Now, it's not too distant from what we've been listening to this afternoon, because I'm interested to notice that most believe that the uh, Psalm 24, written by David, was when there was restoration in Israel. You remember. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, the ark had been displaced. It was in the house of Obed-Edom. There had been a loss of the presence of God. And David was exercised about having things restored. Uh, you know, brothers and sisters, we should appreciate this. Our God still is a God of restoration. 
There's still hope. There still is the possibility of getting things back to where they should be. And I say amen to the very precious and important ministry that we have heard this afternoon, principles of the New Testament assembly, principles of rule in the New Testament assembly. We cannot tamper with the pattern of an assembly, brethren. We need to keep within the confines of the word of God. And I know worldwide that's the attack in the day in which we're fine. Let's change things. Let's introduce our own ideas. Thank God we have the New Testament. And we have the New Testament pattern that God desires that you and I should fo follow out to the key. And it was a man from Toronto, uh, the late uh, missionary that went to Venezuela that wrote the book, It Can Be Done. He used to, he used to say the, the, the system, the, the pattern of gathering to the Lord's name still functions. And thank God that's the case in 2021. But what I want to do, if this psalm was written for that occasion in 2 Samuel chapter 6, when David was bringing the, the ark back from the house of Obedina, I know there was failure in that. And maybe it's a lesson for us. David left the pattern. And you remember the death of Uzzah. I can tell you, brethren and sisters, if we leave the pattern, there's going to be disaster. But it's possible that this psalm was written for that occasion by David and likely sung on that occasion as well, when at last the, uh, the ark was brought back to its place. Now let's look at the psalm very quickly. What is the psalm really bringing before us? The psalm divides into two sections very clearly with the use of this word sila, verses 1 to 6 and then verses 7 to 10. I can write over those first six verses, the rights of the king, the requirements that the rights of the king are fully uh, attended to. And then lastly, verse 7 through to verse 10, and I want to deal with these verses, the lovely verses that should warm our hearts. I want to think of the reception of the king. The rights. It's divided into two sections, this first section of the psalm. I take it verses 1 and 2, it's creational rights. And then verses 4 down to verse number 6, it's his moral rights. Brothers and sisters, I love to see that. Because when, when I'm looking at the psalm and Considering, first of all, creation's rights, my mind goes over to Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. You'll remember it's exactly the same pattern. Chapter 4 of Revelation, God is worshipped. The song of heaven is because of creation. And it's, it's God worshipped because of the work of his hand. But you'll remember in chapter 5, it's not creation, it's redemption. And the Lamb is, is worthy to, to receive the book. He will have the, 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 he has the right to reign. He has the right to, I believe that book is like the, uh, the rights to, uh, uh, to the kingdom, the rights to, to, to creation, the rights to earth. What a wonderful thing it is to link here with the Psalm. He has the requirements. He has the rights. And thank God the day is coming. And he will receive the position that is his. So verse 1 and verse 2. The earth is Jehovah's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. He hath founded it. Its fullness, its foundation. He's founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. I want to stop here. We look at tonight on a, on a world that's reeling under all the confusion of the pandemic. And all the problems with uh, government and with war, etc. Where is the great problem of this world? Brothers and sisters, I believe that this psalm tells us. It belongs to him. And he must have the position. And as long as this world does not give Christ the place that his is, that he is the rightful ruler of, this world will never be right. God help us, I just want to apply this. Don't you get involved in politics. Don't you be involved in anything of the, uh, of the running of this world. 
because the right to reign is his. You and I are pilgrims here. You and I are here just for a little while. The politics of earth, we have no part in. We, have, we belong to him. And we await the day that he will come, whose right it is to reign. He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Now, throughout the rest of the psalm, we have three times the same word used. And I want to draw attention to this. If it, in verse number one and verse number two, it's creational rights. Immediately the question is asked, well, who? It belongs to the Lord. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Now you look down with me to verse number eight. The question is asked, who is the king of glory? And then the question is asked again in verse 10, who is the king of glory? Who is this person? I like to think that in verse number three, the answer is going to be, give, uh, be given. It's his character that's going to be brought before us. Then in verse number eight, if you notice the rest of the verse, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, it's his conquering that's really brought before us. The who is the answer? The answer is the victory and the battle that he has won. And I do take it that that's dispens It's pointing forward to that day when he will have conquested all his enemies. The battle of Armageddon, etc., will all be over. And uh, the, he, he's, he's, what, he's ready to reign. But then lastly, in verse number 10, it's not his character. It's not his conquest. <laughs> it's himself. Uh, we, were, we were hearing yesterday, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. The Lord himself, he, he, who is the king of glory. There's nothing more can be said. It's just what he is. The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory, Selah. But going back, verse number three again, because I need to keep my eye on the time. What are the moral rights of the Lord Jesus? I want to notice that there are four that are brought before us here. A beautiful picture, a beautiful uh, way of understanding and seeing the perfections of the Savior. He uh, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, who shall stand in this holy place? Number one, he that hath clean hands. What a blessed truth. The hands of the King, the hands of the Savior. And a pure heart, the heart of the Savior, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, the humility of the Savior, nor sworn deceitfully the honesty of the Savior. Brothers and sisters, let's think of, think of this. Is there anyone on earth that really can fulfill these requirements? That is beyond him. Clean hands. Many rulers of earth, it's not clean hands they have. It's corrupt hands. It's defiled hands. A heart speaks of the desires. Here is one who's pure in heart. There's absolute purity here in all his, his designs and his desires. Who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity. You know, there's something about the rulers of earth so often. They're, off, they're, they're far off from the, the population. There's pride there. Thank God there's one. You know, I love the picture that we have in Isaiah uh, chapter 40. He will carry the lambs in his bosom. What a shepherd. What a king is coming. And you and I long to see. What a one. He lifted up not his soul unto vanity. Nor sworn deceitfully. You think of his mouth. You think of the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. You think of even those men in John 8. That came to take him. They had to say. Never man spake like this man. Brothers and sisters. What a saviour. You and I have his hands, his heart, his humility, his honesty. Does he have these requirements? Thank God he does. There's not one that has anyone that anything like it. He is unique. The uniqueness of his person. Verse number five. It's the assurance that's linked to these uh, to these requirements. 
he shall receive the blessing of the Lord and the righteousness and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That is the key to the success of his reign will be this blessing and righteousness will reign. Righteousness is something that's missing from earth. We await that day when righteousness will be the, the key to his kingdom. What a day lies before in that millennial reign of the Lord Jesus. Blessing and righteousness. And I want to draw your attention to verse number six. Because this verse is, it has a number of difficulties, even as to the text. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face. O Jacob, Selah. Some of the original texts, I think it's the Subturgent, permit the words, O God of Jacob, at the end. Whereas some of the more older texts just leave it exactly as we have in, in our text here. O Jacob. Why does it not say, O Israel? Why does it say Jacob, the supplanter, the one that has failure? And look again at the verse. This is the generation of them that seek him. Now, what does the this go back to? Can I, under, can I say it just the way that I've come to understand this verse? That the generation that's going to be linked to his reign will have some of the same features of these requirements that the Savior has. And that's what I want to bring in practically right now for us all. You and I are part of this kingdom. You and I will be associated. Thank God, we will be the bride of the, of the Lamb. We will, we will share in his reign. We're going to reign with him. But if the generation in that day will have to have the requirements, I, I do take it that it would be very small but nothing less than this is expected from you and I. This is the generation of them that seek him. Let's go through the four again. Clean hands. Brethren and sisters, is it not sad that in a world of defilement that you and I could have our hands unclean? And I mean this. It's my exercise to cover this today. Brothers and sisters, we are going to be in problems. If we are letting uncleanness come into our lives. Our brother Andrew Usher touched on this today. And I said, Amen. God has requirements of holiness. That he desires that you're... You see, when we think of a hand, it's something we're doing. It's something that we're touched with. It's very interesting in the book of Exodus to go through the references to the hand. Hand. I even thought about speaking on this at this conference. Exodus chapter 4. Moses was told to put his hand into his, his, his breast. And the hand became as white as, as, white as snow with leprosy. What a lesson. This, that hand could be, become defiled, even not even with what, the, what was ex external. The passage actually deals before with a rod that had been in his hand when it was uh, cast on the ground. It became a, a, a serpent. But that hand could be placed into something that was very personal and to become defiled. Brothers and sisters, we are, so, we are associated with one who is the king of kings. His hands were clean. Is it too much that your hands and mine should have something of his character? His hands, what about our heart? What are de our, our desires? What is really the object, the, the focus of your life and mine? What do we put our, our emphasis into? Is it purity? Are our desires what they should be? And a pure heart. You know that Jeremiah 17 says, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. 
The heart that's here wasn't like that. My Savior was perfect. But brethren, we have an example in him. It should touch us all today. His hands were clean. His heart was pure. May God help us that your heart and mine, the desires that we have within, the, the ambitions, the emotions, that they should be pure. What about not lifting up his soul, his humility, onto vanity? Brethren and sisters, uh, I, I'm not being critical now. I really feel that we are so unlike the Savior in this. We can become so proud. We can become so standoffish. We can think so much of ourselves. Who are we, brethren? Who really, really, what was our past? I was just a sinner. I'm going to be speaking in the gospel in a few moments' time, and I'm going to be telling you, just like our brethren have done, how I got God's salvation. Just whenever I look back and remember what I was, I was a lost sinner. I should have been in hell. Is there anything of pride that can fill my heart? Oh, may God help us, brethren, to think about this. Oh, the example of the Savior. He lifted up not his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Brethren and sisters, our word should be our bond. There should be absolutely nothing of deceitfulness in anything that we're doing or saying or double meaning. God help us as we think of the Savior. And I've got to pass on these four lovely features of the coming King should be reflected in you and I, the generation that's going to be associated with his kingdom. I have six minutes. Very quickly before, I don't want to steal my brother John's time. Let's move to the second part of the psalm. The reception of the king. I was noticing these days, and I've heard this often, the illustration given on the 11th of December, 1917. General Edmund Allenby approached the Jaffa Gate of Jerusalem. Some years before the German Kaiser had entered Jerusalem on a white horse. I love to think of the British General Allenby and what he did that day, that day. He could have entered on an animal just like the Kaiser. He didn't. You can look up the story and historians will tell us, and indeed there are, there are actually photographs still uh, that you can, you can see of that general, he desert, uh, he, he got, I was going to use a Portuguese word, he got off his animal, he even took off his, his head covering. And I understand, he said, a greater than General Allenby is worthy to enter this city on a white horse. Brethren, it's here. What a day it will be when the saviour of sinners, he once left this very, these very gates carrying a cross to go to the place which is called Calvary. Now the day of glory has come. Five times over in these, is it four verses? Five times over, we have an expression that is unique to this psalm. It's not found anywhere else in the, in the Bible. What is it? The king of glory. I have loved this, really has enriched my soul to think about this title, the King of Glory. What does it really mean? The splendor, the supremacy, far more. He is the one. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13 will tell me, he will bear the glory. He will be supreme. Yet, he is the one that approaches the gate. <laughs> what a day that will be, brethren. When the one who is, has the right to reign is approaching the hill of the Lord. Now, I, I know there's a question as to exactly what is here. Is the hill of the Lord in that day, that future day where the temple will be? 
Or is it the throne of David that we, that we have brought before us here? I leave that with you for to consider in your own study. It's not, re not really important because it's the gates that are here. I understand that on special occasions, those gates that entered Jerusalem had three parts. There were the parts that opened underneath, but there was the head of the gate. It was a very special occasion whenever those apart and see, uh, above the, the other two parts was lifted up. I think that's the idea, because this is a special occasion. There'll never be an occasion more special than the King of Kings, the King of Glory, is going in. He's called the Lord. Verse number eight, the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. But I was enjoying the other phrase that we have, the other title of the Savior, the King of Glory. He is the Lord, Jehovah. But he is the Lord of hosts. I wonder, did you ever notice that this is really an expression that commences in the first book of Samuel? The first reference that you have to the Lord of hosts is found in 1 Samuel chapter 1. It's never, never found before that. It's against the background of Shiloh, all the defilement, all the departure. <laughs> I was thinking of our brethren as they were speaking. Could we link it with this? Despite the defilement of Shiloh, despite the defilement of Eli and his sons, and the, per the, the permission of, of that which was totally rejected by God, you know that it's in the Psalms that we discover that Shiloh was set aside. It's a terrible thing when God has to set aside that which should have been for his glory. But it happened in Shiloh. But it's in the midst of days like that that we find this wonderful title for the first time, the Lord of hosts. But that's not the only point that I want you to notice. Did you ever notice that this title, the Lord of hosts, is only found four times in the Psalms? Twice over it's found in Psalm number 46. That Psalm that I think it was Luther that said that it was the gem of the Psalms. God is our refuge and, and strength. Um, verse at number seven, the Lord of hosts is with us. Brethren and sisters, this one that's coming in that day, and he will have the, the place of, of, of supremacy. Just think, think today, his presence can be enjoyed in your life and mine. The Lord of hosts is with us. Same words are used again. Verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Are we facing trial in our day? Are there difficulties that you and I are having to, to, to cope with? Take encouragement today, dear child of God. The Lord of hosts is with us. He is our, our refuge. The other reference is found in Psalm number 48. And it's really the city of the, the, the Lord of hosts. Verse, verse 8 of Psalm 48. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts. The place that's his. But here in the psalm, it's not his protection. It's not his place. What is it that we have here? It's his person. He's coming and he's right. He has the right to reign. Here he's been received. I know we were told not to, to be quoting hymns, but I, I, I can't hold this one back. And when he comes in bright array and leads the conquering line, it will be glory then to say that he's a friend of mine. Brethren and sisters, let's get focused. The one that we love, he will have the glory. He will have the supreme place. Thank God we're going to share it. I'm glad I'm saved today. I could have known him as the judge. Thank God we're going to be with him and like him for all eternity. I trust that this psalm will be an encouragement to us all. 
help, help us just to understand. Brethren and sisters, in days of disappointment, declension, difficulty, let us get focused. God's purposes have not changed. He will have the preeminence. He will have the supreme place. May we live in view of it in our life right now and live for him in view of that day. May God bless us, bless his word to us all.